you don't want me to make jokes. All right. Welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking over the topic of recursion. Um, in overview, we're going to be talking about what is recursion? How does recursion help space and time complexity when we're talking about algorithms? Uh, building a recursive function will cover the, the steps of recognizing what this, um, what our base case is and what our recursive case is and building that function out. Then we're going to go over the call stack. What exactly is happening behind the hood? What is the call stack? And how can we visualize it? Then we'll be going over recursion versus iteration and common recursive patterns. Does anyone have any questions over the topics that we will be covering today? All right, if there are no questions, then let's go ahead and start off with, well, what is recursion? Well, recursion is uh, essentially just a, how do I explain it here? Let's say we have a, we have a huge problem, right? But we realize that that problem actually just requires us to take three individual steps, depending on each if statement. Well, rather than trying to take each one of these steps in some sort of while loop or some sort of for loop, what we can do is call this, these problems recursively. And by calling these problems recursively, we can take each individual problem and break it down into even smaller problems. And every time this problem turns smaller, we get closer and closer to our answer. Until finally, once we meet our result, where for this example, let's just say that I'm trying to figure out where n is equal to one. Well, once n is equal to one, then all of it comes back to the very top and it gives me my result of, let's say, sum is equal to 12, all right? A better visualization of this, let's say we have a list of numbers. All right, we, we've been talking about list this, this whole time, so why would we make it any different today? Wow, I can't do straight lines, all right. Let's uh, stick to the arrow tool. Well, I want to take this list of numbers, and what I want to figure out is what is the sum of the entire list? OK. Well, if what I want to figure out, what is the sum of the entire list? And let's say I can't use a built-in function like sum, or uh, you know some of the other tools that are available to us in Python to actually be able to grab the sum of a list, and I want to do this manually, all right? Well, let me go ahead and write a couple of numbers here. Let's say we have three, we have seven, two, and then finally we have four, all right? Well, what exactly is my problem here? I want to grab the sum of every single one of these, uh, of every single index within this list. Well, if I want to grab the sum of every single index within this list, it would make sense for me to write code somewhere along the lines of for, um, I don't know, maybe something like sum is equal to zero, and then for num in list of nums. Oh, hold on sum plus or equals num. And then finally, at the end of that, I would return my sum. All right, so here's my, here's my case. What I'm doing here is I'm going through each individual number. First, I create an outside variable. And as I go through, I say, well, now uh, I want 0 to add 3. I want 0 to add 7, then 2, then 4. Until finally my list is over, at which point I return zero, all right? Well, this works great in the grand scheme of things of as far as uh, being able to return this information. But what if I didn't want to have a variable such as sum? All right, what if sum isn't something that I wanted to return? What if I wanted to dumb down my problem 
so that every time my problem worked or every time I ran my function, the only thing that should happen is something like total plus next number. That's in reality what I need, right? So I would take three plus seven from three plus seven. I would have something like uh, three plus seven plus two. And then from there, I would make one final call to the stack where I would have three plus seven plus two plus four. So here we have three plus seven. This one would be three plus seven plus two. And then finally, we would have three plus seven plus two plus four. But this isn't actually how the code would compile, right? So three plus seven would happen this way. That would give us 10. Rather than having three plus seven plus two, what we would have is 10 plus two. And then what we would have on our final stack would be somewhere along the lines of 12 plus 14. And when we return this entire value, we would still get the answer of 16. It's just that rather of doing it through a for loop, we would be doing it through a recursive function that would work just like this, All right? So we could already start visualizing what's called the call stack. We can see that there's a first stack, a first call, and it works its way down all the way into our last case or our last variable inside of our list, at which point we return the list. Does anyone have any questions over this so far? No questions at all. Okay, so let's start actually writing this down into, I'm gonna switch these two around uh, just so that we can see it first and then afterwards we can talk about how it affects our time and space complexity. So let's start building this code out. I have my list of numbers. And again, what I have is three, seven, two, and four. And what I make is I make a function that returns or sum the list. This takes in a list. You're gonna say sum is equal to zero, or I guess I'll say total. Now I'll say four number in list of nums, total plus equals num and return total. Well, now if I run print, sum the list, I want it to return or, and then pass it the list of numbers, I would expect it to return 16, just as we previously stated. Let me go ahead and run this, this example file here. Well, we can see that it worked, right? It was able to iterate through it and return 16, but it's not using this call stack. It's actually occupying memory space when I create total. And then after I create total, it is changing the value of total every single time I iterate through that for loop, which also throws me into O of n. Oh, excuse me, in, into, uh, yeah, that is O of n, which also throws me into O of n. And then finally it returns my total. All right. So currently right now I have a linear time function that will iterate through the list of numbers, um, occupy memory space, change the value of that memory location over and over again as I go iterate through the, through the memory space, and then finally return my total. So we've talked about this before. O of n means that I'm in linear time. So as the number of input increases, so will the time that it takes my algorithm to come up with a conclusion. Well, now, how could I solve this recursively? Right, so let's say recursive sum the list still takes LST. All right, so if it's still changing LST,
what exactly can I do to mimic this behavior that we have drawn down before, drawn down below? All right, we know that what I want is something along the lines of total plus next. So I can say return, and I can pass in the first index of the list. So list at index zero. So that's the first one. And I can add it. What I would want is the next step, right? So I can say something like LST at at index one. Well, if I run something like this, that takes care of the very first base case, right? Where I'm adding three plus seven, but what about all these other ones down below? They're not being triggered. So in order to pass this information down into the function and have it trigger over and over again, well, what I would do is I would call this function one more time recursively. And then I would pass in the list. But I wouldn't pass the entire list in. I would pass it in. Cut, right? I would slice the list. And I think the first index is exclusive. So I would pass it in zero. That way, rather than passing the entire list into the function, it would pass the remaining three into the function. Okay. Well, that gave me my recursive state. It gave me my function as I wanted to being be executed recursively. But what would be my base case? Where is it that I would want this function to stop? I'm trying to avoid ending up in an infinite loop, right? Where every single time this list is being called or this function is being called, it's consistently calling itself, but it never I never told it when to stop. So what would be the place that I would want this, this uh, specific functionality to just stop? Okay, the last When thing. the list only has one element. Perfect, yeah, when the list only has one element. So I can say if the length of the list is equal to one, then I would just want to return the list at index zero. All right, so now let's take a look at what's going on here. I'm gonna go ahead and pass in rec, sum the list, and pass in the list of numbers. Well, when I execute this example, uh, let me repeat it more than 966 times. I'm probably doing this part wrong. Give me a second just to figure out my list and dicing. It's giving me none. Oh, never mind. It's inclusive, not exclusive. There you go. That's the problem. All right. <clears throat> so the first index is inclusive. I made the mistake of thinking it was exclusive, and that's why I ended up in an infinite loop. But we were able to see the infinite loop being triggered. Right? Well, here we got previous line repeated more than 966 times. But how did it get repeated more than 966 times if it was never put into a while loop or a for loop? Well, let's see what happens when I run this, when I execute this code. Well, now it's returning 16. Okay. Let me print the list here so I can see what the input of my list is every single time. Okay, so now I can see the first input of my list is three, seven, two, and four. The second input is seven, two, and four. Then we see two and four. And finally we get four. Okay, so let's talk about this backwards. Right? We divided our code and made our call stack. This is our stack of everything that was being called. Otherwise the call stack or function was called a total of one, two, three, four times. 
Once that identified that the list, the length of the list was equal to one, it only returned the last number, which was number four. So if this turns into the number four, and that gets added to the number two, which is six, and that's what gets returned. This is then the number six, and that gets added to the number seven, which is now 13. And then finally we get 13 plus three, and we could see that that gives us 16. Well, let's take a look at what we're actually looking at here. Let's say I'm gonna make a couple of, um, of variables, which is going to occupy some space, but um, first, well, second. That is okay, because what we wanna see <clears throat> is we wanna be able to visualize the stack here. Okay, so now, now I'm gonna print the list, but I'm also gonna print what first plus second is. And that's gonna happen every time before the, iter before the iteration. So let's take a look here. All right, <clears throat> so it goes through and we can see that the remaining, the remaining of the list never gets called, right? We get first, and second. Second is called in my call stack, which is the reason why we can see it going down every iteration. And then we can see it start backwards. All right, so now we see that first is represented by two, two plus four. And actually you're right, uh, David, we should probably just draw this out. No, I may be jumping the gun here. Yeah, let's go ahead and take it one step at a time. All right, so first we have our original stack of three plus four, or three, seven, two, and four. And let me actually draw them out as specific indexes here. Okay, so we have three, seven, two, and four. Well, when we start going through this actual list, the first number that gets retained here on line 31 is three. So three stays. The second number that goes into the call stack is the rec of the sum. We're essentially calling this variable again, but we're passing our entire list. We're only seven, two, and four or the next list that gets called on the function. All right, seven is retained as the first number. And then second is the remaining of the function or the remaining of the list, which is two and four. And we can see that happening down here. Finally, it's still not the length of one. So it calls, it retains the number two as the first number, and then it passes the number four into 
the function. So now it hits our base statement. It says, all right, well, this isn't working. I mean, this is finally the length of one. So now that it's the length of one, I'm just gonna return the very first number in the index. Now let's pay attention to this part, right? I am returning first plus second. So second, at this point, what is the number second? It would be four. Four, right? Okay, so here we have four. Where is first located? All right, if we went through this stack here, which one of these two numbers would be first? Two. All right, so then two. would be our first. Okay, so now this function on line 16 is saying that I want to return first plus second. So once we add these two together, what these two would give us is the number 10. Oh, I'm sorry, the number six. Okay, so that's what's being returned here, the number six. When this value of number six gets returned, which one of these two variables is holding the number six? Be second. Okay, so it falls into second. So we already went over two, two and four. So I'm gonna put those up here. So now we know that number six is second. And if I'm looking at my call stack, if I already went through two and four, what would be my number one? Would that be three or would that be seven? Seven. All right, so now seven is my first. So now I could bring those two down, add those two together, and once I add these two together, and let me actually make that a little shorter here. Once I add these two together, what I would get is 13. So now I can take these two numbers and move them up here. We can see that the call stack combines them. All right. And now I get 13. So now that I have the number 13 and the number three, what variable is holding the value of 13? Is it first or is it second? <clears throat> second. All right, so second would be holding the value of 13 because here we can see that that's what's being returned within the function. And here we can see the number three is holding the first index. So finally it adds those two together. And once those two get added together, we get the final result of 16. All right, so we can see our call stack being built up. It starts, it ends once it identifies that four is by itself. It gets returned into the variable of second. Second plus two is six. Or I'm sorry, four plus two is six. Six then gets returned into the value of second. Now we have seven plus six, which is 13. 13 gets returned as the value of second because we're calling this recursively. And then finally we get three plus 13 and that gives us 16. Right, and we just finish this function by calling it recursively rather than calling it through a linear, uh, through a, um, 
linear function. Okay, so now let's take a let's take care of this. We never created a variable. We have all of this code. And what I'm returning is first plus the function below. All right. Let's take another approach at seeing how this works. We have this Python tutor here on the right-hand side. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and take this code. And I'm gonna have this Python tutor try to visualize this code for me and break it down. Well, let's visualize the execution. I'm not sure if I have to actually call the function here. Okay. Let me open up this window a little bit. So first it tells me that I make a global variable named rec and sum. Okay, and then after that, that's gonna stop my code. So I'm gonna go ahead and edit it. I'm gonna go ahead and put this function in there. Okay, so the very first line that gets executed is print rec sum with the list of numbers. And I think I messed this up because I never gave it the list of numbers. All right, let's try this third time. Third time's a charm. All right, so we see that we create a list of numbers. That's the first line being executed. Next, it creates a global variable named rec sum. And it looks like what it's taking in. So here we have list of numbers. And it has three, seven, two, and four. So now we can see that there is a list that was created. That's a little memory allocation there. And then we can see that there's a function that's been created. And both of these are holding a memory location now. Well, now I call the function. Uh, I'm so sorry, Adam. I'm getting a lot of noise on the chat. Um, I'm sorry. I was about to say in the chat that link should have the code already in it if anyone wants to pull it up in Python Tutor. And I'll throw the Python Tutor link in the chat. Sorry for the confusion, Francisco. All right. Moving forward. Um, now that we're calling our actual list here, let's take a look at what that's doing. So it tells me it's calling the list and it's checking if the list is equal to one. Well, that doesn't get executed. So now what it does is it calls the function again, but rather than calling the function where the original list is three, seven, two, and four, it's calling it where it's seven, two, and four. And we're going to see this pattern being continued. Now we have two and four. And then finally, it calls it where the only line is four. OK, great. Well, now let's see what happens when they start coming back together. We can see that it's been returned because it hits where the le length of the list is equal to 1. So the next line to be executed is return list of 0. So now we can see a return value here. Return value is 4. Well, the next line to be executed is going to be number six. So now number, uh, sorry, yeah, the line number six. So now what it's doing is it's taking two and four, adding them together, and its return value is now six. We can see how it's going back up the stack now, checking the return value. Now we have seven, two, and four, which gives us 13. And then finally, it makes it all the way to the top where the original function was called and it returns the 16. And now we can get our printed output, which is 16.
Does anyone have any questions regarding how to build a recursive function? Identifying your base case and identifying your recursive case. I see a couple of questions on the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and go over them. Can you try drawing this out? I am not 100% sure. All right. Uh, okay, perfect. So that was answered. Um, I'm confused as to how LST zero is not three for the first iteration. Okay. Uh, which portion are you talking about uh, in that question right there, Athena? Um. When you're going through and you printed out your first and second um, uh, variables, it said the first thing that was printed was two and then four, and just going back through. Um, so I was confused as to how um, it wasn't list that the index of zero would be three. Uh, but I think you answered it with the, the Python tuner. This was about like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Oh, okay. Got it. Thank you. All right. Well, if that's I been answered, just in case it wasn't answered, um, I want everyone to realize that this is essentially working backwards. It's taking our entire problem, moving our call stack down, right? Where now it's seven, two, and four, then it's two and four, and then finally four. Once it hits our base case, then the actual problem starts working. The remaining of our logic starts being triggered. So once it realizes that four is only the length of one or the list where four is uh, in the index is only the length of one, then the function starts being executed. So now lines 12 and below finally start working. So now line 12 is first um, and where two is first and four is second. That turns into six. Then it comes back up. Again, line 12 and 13 are executed where seven is first and six is second. Then it comes up one more time. And now three is first and 13 is second. It's just working backwards. Does that answer your question, Athena? Um, yes, it does. I do have a question about when, if the length of the list is one and then it returns the list at four, does it do nothing with that four and then it goes into adding um, the two and the four um, at that point. So like when it does actually return four at line 11, I don't see it doing anything with that value. Okay. So just to clarify, you're saying what happens when the list is only holding one index and it being returned and what's the value behind that? Yes. Okay. So the whole purpose of this base case is to identify that I can't add anymore. There's nothing else to add, right? I want to make sure that there's nothing to the right of that list so that I could add. So I check if the length is two. I could check if the length is two uh, rather than one if I wanted to save myself a little bit of recursion. Um, but I want to check if it's equal to one so that I could just return that one number on its own and I could start the addition process here on line 15. Does that make sense? Or that I totally missed your question. Um, I think I'm still confused because you're saying you can start the addition process and it's returning list at the index of zero. And at that point, four is the index of zero. But when it goes into the rest of the function, it's second and it's at the, um, the first index. Got it. So first is the index, you're right. So number four is the index of zero here in line 11, right? But it is only the index of zero in line 11 as far as that recursive call goes in that point of the stack, right? So if we're, if we're dividing this into the stack again, right, where we see it fall down. So four is at index zero in this specific spot. But once it goes into line 12, right? Or once it, this it gets executed, this function call, the first time that this function was called is now over. So now think about the previous call. 
in the previous call, the numbers that we're iterating were two and four, where four got passed into this list or the call of the function and it was returned. So now second is equal to four, whereas first is equal to two, because this is the current list that I'm working with. And the same thing continues happening. So once it goes down and it says first plus second, well, that gets returned. This return statement is in relation to line 13. Does that make a little more sense, Athena? A little, yeah. Okay. We'll look at a couple of more examples and that might help us visualize it. And I see there's a couple of questions on the chat. If we could please make sure to put all of our questions inside of the Whiskey Questions channel, I would appreciate it. So is this first in or last out? Um, is it first in, last out? It is, yes, that's correct. Uh, no questions. I think the PowerPoint from the old curriculum repo did a good job showing the, the call stack. It helped me understand last night. I was trying to read ahead. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Natalie. Let me go ahead and, oh, did you share the link to that already, Adam? Thank you. Yeah, I'll throw it in our ski channel now. Okay, <clears throat> great. So we just saw that happening. We saw it breaking down. Let's try to look at it in a different perspective and have you guys lead me through where exactly we are in, in the call stack. <clears throat> so I'm going to create this variable called call stack. And every time that we go through and call this again, I'm going to go ahead and pass in the call stack and make it more than what its prior value was so that we can see each time this function is being called. I'm going to get rid of this first plus second since we no longer need it. All right, let's go ahead and run this one more time. So when this when this gets run, I'm not only keeping track of the function anymore, I'm also keeping track or of my list anymore. I'm also keeping track of how many times the function itself gets called. So call of function. Okay, so here's my original list. Can someone please tell me what this code will do if we're going line by line when past this list? There, yeah, once you just see call stack increment by one for uh, recursion. So if there's four items in the list, you'll see it go from zero to. Uh, well, zero, one, two, three. I don't think it'll go to four. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So, what would be the line ten? What would happen when I when line ten gets triggered, uh, Lewis? Uh, you decided to zero. Uh, so I think it. I don't know if it would go if it would just print zero, uh, four times, or if it would actually like increment. But I don't see anything incrementing it, so I think it would just print zero four times. Okay, so we got zero. Now, this if statement here is asking if the length of the list is equal to one. And let's see. Steven, would this if statement get triggered if this was my list that gets placed into my function? I want to say yes. Go ahead. Can you say that again, Steven? Yes. 
So my if statement is asking if the length of the list is equal to one. What's the current length of my list? Four. So it would be no. Okay, so that if statement doesn't get triggered. So what is this line of code down here doing? And I'll pass that off to you. Go ahead and pass it off to the next person, Stephen. Uh... Too much pressure? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I, I can take a stab at it. Um, let's see. So it's going to return the, the list at index 0, which is 3 plus the list and that, oh, that's slicing so it um let's see and seven so it's because it, the the slicing is uh what did you say it's inclusive so the one is actually then start with zero so that's going to be seven All right that's what i'm telling you to do here um let me see Doesn't it just slice the, the seven off and then the other, the two and the four is kind of stay not in the call stack? Yeah. So if I were to do this, then it would call only seven. Right? Okay. But because I'm passing in that, that colon, what I'm doing is telling it to slice the rest. Okay. Of it. Awesome. All right. And now the call stack would be equal to one. Right, meaning that the function has been called one time. Okay, awesome. So now my new function that's being called again from the very start is seven through four. So this print call stack would print one because I, that's what I passed it in as the call stack. Now, uh, Brian, what would happen in this if statement if when I'm asking if the length of the list is equal to one, when I'm calling the function with seven, two, and four as my list. If the list that's passed in has a length of three, then that code won't execute as far as I can tell. So uh, meaning, meaning the return, you know, the base case return list of, of zero, the first element won't execute. What it'll do is it'll go down to the return below that and peel off the first element list zero, uh, which is seven. And then it'll recurse and, and try to add the remainder of that list through you know more recursive calls, which will eventually return six, add that to the seven that you currently peel off and eventually return 13. Is that right? Okay, awesome. Yeah, so we just said that it's not gonna trigger because of the seven and instead, it's going to trigger line 13, where now 7 is index 0. And then it's going to call the call stack again and increment my call of my function by 1. So now I'm calling it two times. All right. So that comes down. I'm calling my function again. It is still not the length of 1. So it's going to say, all right, well, then if it's not the length of 1, then I'm going to trigger line 13, where the return statement is going to hold list at index zero and then add the recursive call to the next function. And now my function has been called three times or repeated three times. So finally, my length of my list is equal to one. So I return the number four. And now I can execute line 13, right? Where two plus four gives me six. That then comes up to the second time my function was called, where that gives me 13. And then that comes up one more time to where my function is three, seven, um, three plus seven plus two plus four. So we see it break down 
like this. And then we just see it build back up. So this is what's happening in our call stack. It's essentially just building its way back up and down in a pyramid motion. Oh, Francisco, there's a request. Are you able to pull the screen to the right to view code completely or reduce the font size? Got it. I think, uh, what is it? Option Z will also turn on line wrapping in VS Code. Someone can maybe confirm in the Zoom chat if I have that right. Yeah, I mean, I could wrap it if you would like. Um, I don't necessarily, I'll just go ahead and open up the screen. Does anyone yeah. have questions regarding this specific movement here? What it, does anyone have any questions regarding this one function of recursion? No one has any questions. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Quick question. Uh, I was just wondering, just to make sure, are, did we just have the call stack there just to keep track of how many times it happened? Yeah, exactly. I just wanted to see how many times this call stack was happening. We can see it that it happens the first time. And rather than happening, I want to see how many times it's repeated. So it's repeated one, two, and three times before it starts returning. Okay, thank you. Would it be possible for you to do like a side-by-side -side, um, comparison of the call stacks with um, with the for loop as well? Does that make sense? A comparison. Uh, well, the there wouldn't be a call stack in this for loop, right? So in this for loop, there isn't a call stack. It's just iterating through the number and adding it to that one. I could add a step count uh, if that's what you mean. But that wouldn't be the stack. OK, never mind. That makes sense. Uh, go ahead, Tom. I think something that I had trouble with, or I have trouble with, like recursion. So is the, is the point of using recursion here to try and, like, is it more efficient for memory space? Are we not using, because we're not initializing another variable, and adding um like adding things to that other variable um and then returning it back are we saving memory space by using recursion because we're not necessarily like initializing anything else or like what is the um like efficiency step for using recursion here yeah definitely so let's talk about um the benefits of recursion right how exactly is it that recursion can change? Well, first of all, I want to make it clear, like recursion isn't the magic answer to everything. Um, just because you're utilizing recursion doesn't mean that you're making a more efficient algorithm because you could be forcing recursion when recursion isn't necessary, all right? So now the time complexity analysis of how can you improve recursion or how can you improve your time complexity analysis when utilizing recursion? Well, if you're able to identify your base case correctly, all right. Anything that takes in any form of a while loop or a for loop can be fixed through recursion. So if you have nested loops that are already happening within your function, you could get rid of one of those nested loops by turning it into a recursive function. And if you turn it into a recursive function, rather than having O of n squared, you just have one loop and now you go back to linear time. And it's not reiterating over and over again, right? So I'm fixing my time complexity by utilizing recursion 
and avoiding going outside of linear time. Does that answer your question, Tom? Yes, thank you. So basically, like, it's uh, it's not for use in like every case, like if, you know, instead of iterating, just use recursion. But like, if you're going to find yourself like using a bunch of iteration, like seeing if uh, recursion will kind of like meet your niche use case right there. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Thank you. So if you have like a large list of numbers, then which one is going to be more efficient? Yeah, if I have a, la a large list of numbers, which one would be more efficient? Um, I guess that would be, in this case, in this specific case where we're looking at both of these functions, both of them are in linear time, all right? Neither of them is necessarily more efficient as far as logarithmic time goes, or sorry, as far as big O complexity goes, because both of these are happening in linear time. This isn't a, com a complicated enough algorithm to where we can make a change in big O. The difference here, is sum requires an actual explicit for loop to be written and to occupy a memory space that will be cons consistently changed over each iteration of that for loop. Whereas, rec of, uh, whereas our recursive function does not have any of that extra memory space. It's not assigning any extra variables that we don't need. Instead, what it's doing is it's iterating through the same function over and over again, and it never occupies any actual solid space until it's done, All right? Once it has the information it requires, then it kills the function. That's what makes it more efficient in that case. And then I see your question, Athena, about uh, being confused why the slicing happens before uh, the addition. So rather than thinking about it in this perspective, Think about it like this. Every time that we call this rec of some function, what we're actually doing is we are telling it to repeat this step. All right. So this rec of fun, this rec of uh, some function doesn't work. So every time that I do this specific line. What I'm actually telling it to do is do list plus, and then I'm telling it to identify if the list of index is equal to one. And if it's not, then it continues going on over and over again. And that's why we see this stack happening in a pyramid motion. So this line right here on the right-hand side can't be executed or can't this entire line of line 15 can't completely be executed until a return value is returned to that function. So that function has to happen first before the line can be completed. Does that make sense, Athena? All right. Go ahead, Nika. Um, okay, so if I'm understanding this correctly, uh, with recursion, it would be first and last out, like you're stacking pancakes. Um, and then when you're done stacking them, you always take the first pancake off and you go back down. And so with recursion, it would always be whatever is first in would be last out. It wouldn't ever be anything different because of the way recursion works, right? Is that we, we have a stack of pancakes. We're saying we want to stack the pancakes. And once we get to the very top of the pyramid, then we can start putting the right. So that's a that's a good analogy. We have our stack of pancakes, we take the top one, and then afterwards we start building all the way back down the stack of pancakes until the base. Right? That's what you okay. okay, perfect. Uh yeah, because I, I remember I was I was looking at the slides mm -hmm. and with the factorial and they were showing how it builds up and then comes back down. And so that I'm just making sure I'm understanding so that I can, um, so I could just understand. Right. I like pancakes too, Michael. All right, any other questions regarding this specific um, use case of recursion?
All right. If there are no other questions regarding this one use case of recursion, let's try to visualize our call stack a little better. So I'm going to go ahead and try to build a countdown to visualize the call stack. I'm going to say that the function of countdown takes in a number. And all I want this to do is I want this function to stop. So here, we'll do it this way. We want this function to print the current number in the function and stop when it gets to zero. So if I were to read this word problem right here, what would be my base case? Whenever it gets to zero. Okay, great. So then I could say if n is equal to zero, then all I wanted to do is return. I want to kill my function. All right. So while it's not equal to zero, what would I want this to do? We identified our base case. What is the functionality that should happen every time this function is iterated? Print in. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and print n. All right. Well, I know that if I was to do this not recursively, I would say while n is greater than zero, uh, print n, and then I would say n minus equals one. So what would be my recursive call after line 25? Is it a, a return space and then call the function countdown and then pass in n minus one? Exactly. So I'm still taking that while loop statement down below. I want to iterate down, but rather than putting in a while loop, I'm passing it into the function itself of countdown. And I saw someone had their hand up. I think that was Mike. I might be wrong. It was me, uh, Landon. Landon pretty much nailed it there. That's that's what I was going to say. Okay, perfect. Natalie? Um, can you just tell me why we need to add the return? If we just did countdown n minus 1, would it do the same thing or not? Why we need to add the return? Are we talking about line number 26? Yes. Got it. Uh, I don't think we need to add the return in this case, because as long as we're continuously calling the function, it would work. Um, I think I mainly do that out of habit because, you know, functions are supposed to return something. I apologize. But yeah, this should execute as well. Let me go ahead and put it to practice real quick. Oh, let's go with five. Okay, so we could see it's practice there. We got five, four, three, two, and one. All right, so the number five gets fed in. Let's try to build our own call stack here. All right. So in the first one, five gets fed in. Five is not equal to zero. So because it is not equal to zero, it gets fed to the next stack where it is now four because of line 26. We do n minus one. Then it continues all the way down to one. We still call line 26 where one minus one is equal to zero. But now because it's equal to zero, line 23 gets called and it just returns and kills the function. Right, we start off at five, work our way down by subtracting one and calling this function recursively. And now we can visualize how the call stack happened, right? We can visualize the call stack happening in line five, where the value was five. Oops. 
we see it happen again where the value was four. It gets called again where it was three. And here we're building our pancakes. Finally, we get two. And then we get one. This is essentially what's happening when we run recursion. We're calling the function within itself to try to divide our functionality that we want repeated over and over again. Okay, I see Landon, you're typing out a question. I'll wait until you finish typing it out. In the meantime, does anyone else have a question regarding visualizing the call stack or the topics that we've covered of recursion up to this point? I have a quick question. Yeah, of course. Um, you, I believe it was mentioned earlier that, was it that most of the time that when we have a uh, for while loop, we can substitute it with a type of recursion if it fit our um, context? Or what was that that was mentioned earlier again? I just wanted to reiterate. Yeah, definitely. So almost anything that utilizes a for or a while loop, any sort of loop can be fixed through recursion. You just have to identify what is it that kills your loop, right? So for example, in this countdown, what killed my loop was if n was greater than zero. So my statement, my base case was n being equal to zero. That's what's supposed to kill my loop, all right? And then any behavior that goes within the while loop well, that's what happens recursively. And then what helps you iterate through the while loop, which in this case, line 31 is where we subtract from n by one. Well, that's what's supposed to go into the function as your recursive value. Gotcha, thank you. Of course. <clears throat> Go ahead, Will. Uh, yeah. Um, how common is recursion in like production level code because of um, how like memory intensive it is? You're saying why is um, recursion in production level code? Production level code? Uh, like how common it is? It is. Hmm. That's actually a really good question. I may have to do a little bit of research on my side and get back to you on that because I don't want to just give you some random um, random words. So I'll get back to that question in one-to-one. -one. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is in regards to applying what you're showing us to nested for loops. I assume we could apply the same recursive logic and could recursively call the loop again. Right, so we just did, uh, we did this little analogy. Did that answer your question, Landon, or do you want a different example? It, it was uh, based on the uh, the problem that we did the other day where we're basically checking if uh, a certain value in a list plus another value in the list down the line equals the target. Um, and you showed us an example using two for loops and we were trying to get it down to, I think, a big O of N only. Could you use recursion to go through the list and check for... Yeah, I think I think you understand what I'm trying to say. Right. I think you're talking about our binary search, right? Where we utilized a while loop and within that while loop we did uh, a little bit of we're going to we're going to do some recursion here shortly. Yeah, that's and that's an awesome question that's actually going to be what we covered. Um currently right now it's already 10:01. I want to make sure that I don't keep pushing us through this concept without giving us a good solid break. So let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break and let's come back at 10:12 to continue our lecture. Thank you so much everyone. All right, so we just finished talking about uh, recursion. Now, the next part that we're going to talk about is refactoring our code 
to putting recursion into practice? Well, we've seen both of these algorithms that are currently on the screen before. Right, we saw this on day one of data structures. We saw simple search versus binary search, where each one has their own um, their own capabilities and limitations. Well, now that we're taking a look at recursion, how could we apply recursion in both of these in both of these uh, scenarios? All right, let's say that I have this simple search function, and I'm going through it, and I just simply want to return the index where the element is found or return negative one if it is not in the list. Let's refactor the simple search to go through recursion. So we have the list above, or we have the code above so that we can reference it. But now we're just going to build it in a recursive format. So we know that the worst scenario would be that our the target is not within our list. So if that's the worst scenario or that's where I would return a default statement, what is that known as when I'm talking about recursive statement or a base or in my recursive case or my base case? What would that be? That'd be your base case, right? If you go through the entire list recursively and there's the, the target doesn't show up. Right, perfect. So how could I write that recursively? Well, I know that I'm gonna be iterating through the list, right? And at every step of the list, if I'm talking about recursive recursion and going along with what we just learned so far, I'm probably going to cut down the list every single time until the list is equal to none. All right. So how could I, how could I manipulate this information? You're talking about the initial conditional like how to break out of it or for the base case yeah what would it say my function like if target you know then return target so like if it exists if it's conditionally true then you would just do a return of tgt for target okay so if lft at index zero if they're equal then i would want to return true let's just say i'm returning true or false right Okay, what else? Go ahead, Ed. Should be good. If uh, if if they don't match, then you would recursively call the function again, doing the same. What is it? The splice method that you did, where you get rid of the first index. Okay, so that's our recursive case. Awesome. Let's go ahead and run through that. So I'm going to go ahead and say return, simple search, LST, and target. Okay, so now we got what happens if it is in the list and our recursive state. Well, let's try to put this into some application. Let's go ahead and do simple search where my list is 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And my target is two. Well, I would expect that to return something. Well, it looks like it failed. And that's because I didn't um, cut my list, just like Edge told me to. So now when I run it, we see that it doesn't return anything. Weird. Oh, I'm not printing. I apologize. That's my fault. OK, we see that it prints out true. So that's working correctly. But what if my number is not in the list? What happens when I run this? I get a list index out of range. It seems like an edge case. Uh, well, wouldn't you just add a return under that return, but then return false? OK, so I would add something that would return false. Uh, well, uh, well, under the, your return simple search. 
Uh, well, no, because this is my recursive state. So this is what I want to make sure happens. These two conditions are not met. Right? So when is it that I would want to return false? If the first target equals list zero isn't isn't true, you would want it, it would end up being false. If would you wanna would you wanna do if target not in list? Because like if you if target doesn't equal list zero, you don't want to return false because you still need the recursive to run. So we need something like if not if target not in list. What if you add list.length equals one and list zero isn't target, then false? Hmm, I could do that, right? Thinking. If, I do, if, if we're splicing the list, then couldn't we also say if the list is equal to an empty array? Or well, list, rather? So if not list, right? So if my list is empty, because an empty list, we know that's going to be falsy. So if my list is empty, if there isn't a list to work with, return false. Now, when we run this, we get false. All right, let's make sure that it works. What happens if I run the number four? Now we go back to getting true. Okay, great. So we were able to simplify this individual, uh, this individual problem by running it like this. Well, now let me go ahead and throw you guys a challenge. What if I wanted to see the index that I'm currently at? Have a counter variable. Okay, so I could have a counter variable. What is this counter going to be equal to? Or where do I make this counter? Uh, you can initialize it in the actual uh, parameters of the function like you did for the call stack. Nice. Okay, so I have this counter variable, and I what do you want me to make it equal to? Uh, zero. All right. Is there anything else in my code that I need to change? Well, this would return the counter. Then. Would uh, from that counter, since you're like using that splice method, would you have to um, basically count the met the the number of spaces that you were initially going through, and then add it to where it's found in that final list? Well, I'm only moving that. You're essentially right, right? I would want to make sure that I keep a count for every time I move a space. But every time I do this recursively, I'm only moving through one index inside of the inside of this function. So where do I increment this counter? In the recursive call. Every time. Yes. So I can say counter plus one. Okay, so we're passing in the number four, so I would expect to get one, all right? Okay, and then rather than if it's not in the list, I would want it to return negative one, just like we have this example up above. So now when I run this, and let me go ahead and change that for a number that's not in the list, we should see negative one because it got all the way until the list was empty and returned negative one. Awesome. Does anyone have any questions over? Oh, there we go. Go ahead, Nika. Um, does, is it going to matter if we're putting that first if statement, if not, like, basically, if not list or you're looking for it to be false, essentially, and you would return a negative one, is that going to matter if we have that first, or is it going to matter if we have it after uh, line 43 and 44? Awesome. Yeah, that's a great question. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Let's see what happens when I switch these two statements. All right. Remember, I am trying to, here on line 41, I'm trying to enter something called index zero. But when I switch this around, it tells me that list index is out of range. Well, an empty list wouldn't have an index zero. So I have to make sure that this if statement comes first so that it can kill my function before it tries to access something that it doesn't exist. Does that answer your question, Nika? Yes, thank you. All right. Any other questions regarding simple search and recursion? Go ahead, Natalie. I think your actual headset's muted. 
not Zoom, but your headset itself. Okay. I'll wait for the chat. <laughs> Can I explain if not list? Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see how can I explain if not list. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to go ahead and print the Boolean value of an empty list. Well, when I run that, it gives me false. If that list was to have an item inside of it, it would give me true. But because it is an empty list, it returns false. So this statement right here on line 41 is essentially asking, is this list empty? So I'm saying when this returns false, that not turns it into true, which is what triggers the statement. If there isn't a list that's being given to me, then just return negative one. Does that answer your question, Andrew? Of course, no problem. All right, Natalie, uh, is it saying list index out of range because using the recursion, we are eliminating every element and then we end up with an empty list. That's correct. Here on line 45, we're iterating and eliminating one element at a time until we end up with an empty list. And that's why we return negative one. All right. So now that we went over simple search and applying this uh, recursion call into simple search, we can go ahead and start talking about binary search. Well, we know binary search is a lot is a bit more complicated than simple search. And I'm actually going to go ahead and make a full screen here just to make sure that we can see this. So now that we have this binary search, how could I turn this into a recursive function? So keep in mind, up here, we wanted to return the index. So we created a variable named counter for it. But in our original function, we never created a variable named counter because we kept track of the index within the function. So currently, binary search takes needs a couple of things to work correctly. So when we remake our function, we probably want that to no longer live within the function itself, but rather live at the function call level. So how could I create this? Are you saying that low and high would have to be in and with list and, and target like we did with counter before so we can so we can know when they're incremented? Exactly. Yeah, so we would want to make sure that we pass in the target low and high because those will no longer live at the function level because we're getting rid of this, right? That's the whole point of utilizing recursion is to try to save more space. And now we're utilizing it in a recursion state. Okay. So now that we're within the function, what do we need to do? What would be our base case here? Or actually, let's think about a recursive state first. Would we still we would still need to have a variable tracking the index if we find it correct? Well, low and high are going to give us the very low side of the index, so which would be zero, and then high would be the maximum. All right. So we would keep track of whatever of low and high in here for the indexes. Mm -hmm. We would want to pass it into the function itself. So wouldn't we want to just define our low being zero and high being the length of list minus one just to you know figure out our parameters? Yeah, we could do that. Well, we can see the problem there, right? We're trying to grab the length of list, but it doesn't have access to list just yet. So we can't define it up here. We would have to define it once we actually call the function. All right, so when we call the function, it would look something like binary search and recursion, where the list
one, three, five, six, and seven. When we pass it, we would pass the list, the target, which in this case, let's say it's five, the low, which would be zero, and then the max, which would be the length of LST minus one. Okay, so now we, we know how we're gonna call our function the first time. What would be our uh, recursion or recursive case, right? If we're taking a look at this code up above, what inside of this code is happening over and over again? Go ahead, Will. It's taking half of it. Okay, it's so splitting in the half. Yeah, so this portion, right, where we're deciding which half we're going to work with and where the half should be. Okay, awesome. So if we know this is the recursive uh, logic that's happening within binary search with a while, loop, how do we write that out inside of our recursion statement? Uh, you just put list the first argument as, um, I guess, uh, half the half the list. Okay, so what, so I think what you're saying is we want to find our middle, right? So if we want to find our middle, we're just going to go ahead and say the same thing as up above. What is low plus high? Floor division two. And that's going to give us our middle. All right. So now the if statements. What should we do inside of these if statements? What is it that we're checking here? You're checking if the middle is, if your target is higher or lower than your middle. Okay, so if uh, middle LST is higher than target, something's supposed to happen. LF LST mid is I'm going to go about this a different way. So I'm just going to go ahead and turn this into an LF. Yeah, when the first case if mid equals target, you just return that. Yeah. I will just return mid. Okay, and then else, something else will happen. Okay, so what would happen if my list middle is greater than my target? What would I want to do then? Would you call binary search again, but instead of passing low as a, like zero of the first index, you pass low as, um mid plus one. Okay, so here we can see that this would essentially be what we're trying to to annotate, right? Where mm -hmm. the middle is greater than the target. So what would be the list that I'm going to be passing in here? So the list would be the sliced. If mid is greater than target, then it's going to be sliced from the beginning and then colon and then mid um, would be our exclusive end. Okay, awesome. So now what would be our, our target here? The target would remain the same. Mm. All right, what would be our low now? Our low would still be zero yeah. or low, the same low. Okay, so we would keep the same low. And what would be our high? Mid minus one. Okay, the length of LST to middle minus one. Okay, so now we handled what happens if LST middle is greater than target. We handled what happens if we find our middle. Um, but what's going to happen if the target is greater than middle? What should we do then? I have a question. If yeah. if we're slicing to mid, so mm -hmm. like the list, we're passing from index zero all the way to the mid index. 
um, when we when we just pass the length of the list again for high, because then our, our list has been essentially halved. We're passing half of the list back to the function. Uh, so if, go ahead. I guess you are. I, I don't know. I guess like why why do we need to keep track of low and high in um like in the parameters of the function if we're just gonna split the list every time that takes care of it, doesn't it? Yeah, it does actually. So you're saying to pass in just the list, right? Without splitting it, yeah. pass in the low. And rather than passing in the entire length of the list, because we already did that the first time, we would just pass in middle minus one because that's going to tell it what our new high is, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that works as well, right? We don't necessarily need to slice the list anymore because now all we're doing is manipulating our low and our middle. And we're just switching the spots of what low and high are through the middle. Great. So again, what's going to happen? Oh, go ahead, Nika. Could you just say that part, what you just did one more time, just to make sure I understand? Yeah, absolutely. So we have the entire list, right? And in our original statement, what we do is we actively cut the list. Uh, we actively move our left and right as to where it is that we're searching. Somebody used the term of bracketing lesson, right? Well, we're doing the same thing here. We're still passing the same list recursively. We're still passing the same target. But we know that the middle was greater than our target. So our low can stay the same. And instead of doing any sort of uh, slicing or anything like that to the list, all we need to do to grab the length, we already know where middle was located because we did this low plus high for division two. So all we need to make sure is that it looks only on the left-hand side by passing in middle minus one as our new high. Okay, got it. Thank you. Of course. Okay, so what would it look like here in line 75? You'd uh, return binary search rec. All right. And then uh, leave the list the same, target the same, and then you'd manipulate the low into uh, mid plus one, and then leave the high. We're essentially just switching the logic between these two because I'm telling it either look on the left-hand side or look on the right-hand side. Okay, great. So we identified our recursive case and we identified what happens if the list is located within the, with the target is located within the list. So let's run this example. And actually I probably want to print this. And now it's telling me that it is in two. Interesting. So we got zero, one, and two. The number five is located at index two. Well, what happens if I turn this into index seven? Well, it tells me that it's on index four, zero, one, two, three, and four. So we built out our test cases correctly. Well, now I wonder what happens if I pass it something that doesn't exist within the list. I end up going into infinite recursion. It doesn't seem like I handled what to do when we are passing in a target that is not within the list. So how could we handle that? Wouldn't we do it the same way we did earlier? Okay. So have that as the first one to make sure it doesn't evaluate to false. All right. So we got if, and what am I checking here? So if something, I would want to return negative one because it's not in there, right? You would what basically want to check to make sure the target's not, the uh, target's not actually in the list. Well, I'm not manipulating the list anymore. All right, the list is staying the same, and so is the target staying the same. So I would end up in an infinite loop again. What do you think, Saul? Uh, would it be if not list return negative one? Well, I see that we did that before, right? We did this if not list, 
But remember, we were able to do that because we were slicing the list. We're not slicing the list anymore. And not target. What's the only thing that's changing out of these four? If we, if we, my apologies. I, I was just gonna say if we uh, check how like the the length between low and mid, like low and high now that's being passed in. So like if if uh, like if high minus low is equal to one or like is less than two or something because now it won't have like multiple spots to check anymore awesome yeah so at some point our middle will end up being one right or at least that's the base scenario the best scenario would either end up being one or zero once it's done looking through the entire list so if our low is zero and mid minus one let's say that mid was zero that would return negative one Right, so I could check if low is greater than high. So now when I run my list, we can see that it returns negative one. Again, if I pass in an actual number that's within the list, like number one, it would return zero. And if I pass in six, it would return three. So now we made binary search without any while loops inside of it, working through recursive calls. We identified our base case in case that we looked through the entire list and the actual number that we're looking for is not located in the list. And you got to identify this base case by keeping track of what's actually changing, right? In our original search of simple search, what was changing was our list. So we were able to run, if the list is no longer existing, then just return negative one. But in the example of binary search, we were never changing the list and we were never changing the target. So in order to build our base case, we had to utilize low and high because those were the only variables that were changing consistently through the recursive calls. And then I see a couple of questions here on the chat. I see if they approach the same, uh, or I suppose if they go past each other, essentially. Okay. So if we take a look at this, right, let's say high is, um, let's say we're looking on the right-hand side and high is 13 and currently the low is 12, right? Well, 13 plus 12, that would give us 25 floor division of two. The floor division of two would then give us, um, I know, so 25, two, that gives us 12. Yep, gives us 12, right? And once we see that it's 12, well, it goes into the index and it says, well, this, this statement isn't true. Um, so then it goes into our else statement. And then our else statement, we're passing in low, where 12 plus one is now 13, and high is also 13. So it goes through again, does the floor division, gets the 13, only checks the one index of 13. And then it says, all right, well, that's not working. It does the middle, right? Divides, checks that it's, uh, sorry, we're back at 13. So we're at 13 and then it goes through, checks this statement, this statement isn't true. And finally it goes into our else one more time. Well, now what gets passed as our low is 14. And what gets passed as our high is still 13. So if our low at any point becomes higher than our high, we know that we didn't find our match. We essentially squeezed the list so much to where our low and our high overlapped. And now we could just return negative one. Does that answer your question, Nika? Yeah, I was I was just uh I was just saying, I guess it really written. It basically wouldn't matter if we said if low is greater than higher, higher is greater than low, right? Because you're basically taking both of them, you're going across. So it's like missing or or bypassing each other, I suppose. Or would that matter? Yeah, it does matter because we want to make sure that we're checking low is greater than high. If you check if high, you could check if high is lower than low, but essentially you can't check if high is higher than low because that's expected. We would always want the high to be higher than low. All right. If I go through this and I print this out, <clears throat> we can see that the first one was zero, second one was four, then three and four. All right. And now if I look for something that doesn't exist within the list, something like nine, we can see that it goes zero to four, 
it adds those two together. Floor division is two. So we add one to the low and it looks through three to four. We add those two together, it gives us seven. Um, floor division of seven is still three. So we add one and now we got four and four. Notice how the high always stayed the same. Four plus four is eight. Floor division gives us four. We add one to look on the right hand side again. And now we can see that five is greater than four. Our low should never be greater than our high. So it triggers our statement and returns negative one. Okay, thank you. I just, I just, um, sometimes maybe I'm not quite saying what I'm thinking, but um, thank you. Oh, of course, no problem. I misunderstood. Um, I might have misunderstood your question. Go ahead, Will. Uh, would you also have to account for uh, not having a list at all? Okay, awesome. Yeah. So what if my list was completely empty, right? What if my list was completely empty? What would happen when I run this information? Well, it doesn't seem like I have to account for it because if my list is completely empty, my low would be zero and the length of my list minus one would be negative one. So that very first statement on line 70 would say, well, zero is greater than negative one. So it will return negative one upon that first call. Does that answer your question, Will? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Brett? Um, I noticed that um, when you print out our lows and our highs, um, it's giving us like zero, four, three, four, four, four. Um, but four isn't in our list. What if we were to set our target as four? Like, is that going to return um, that like four is start, like it's in the list because it's in between the integers that we have in the list or is it not going to work? Got it. <clears throat> so remember that four is representing the index, right? It's representing the last index within the list, not a number within the list. So if I were to run a number like four, it would still return negative one and it would still continue checking these indexes because the number is not within our list. All right, so we can see right, that. Right, right, okay. Let's stop that. Thanks. Of course. Any other questions over recursion and binary search? So, so can you run it with uh, a number that's out of range or that's not in there? Uh, you want me to try this with a number that's not in there? Yeah. Okay. So number four is currently not in there. I could try a more exaggerative number, something like 100. We know 100 is not inside of the list. And when I run it, it's going to check the same sides and then return negative one. Once the low becomes greater than the high. Cool. That was nice to see the it printing out every instance. Yeah, definitely. All right. If there are no other questions, let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. And then we'll come back to go over one of the problems from yesterday and solving it recursively. Thank you so much, everyone. See everyone in 10 minutes. Resume. All right. So yesterday we went over this. Well, we didn't go over this problem, but yesterday we were assigned this problem on doing recurs a problem that's best fixed with recursion and having to do with linked lists. So we want to remove every node which has a node with a greater value anywhere to the right side of it, returned ahead of the modified linked list. Example. Input head is equal to five, two, uh, three, eight. Well, then the output should be thirteen and eight. And the explanation is that five, two, and three have 13 to the right side of it. Um, five, oh, sorry, 13 is to the right of node two and node eight is to the right of node three. So we can see that the only thing that gets returned is 13 and eight. The second example, we can see that the input is a one, 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 
and we expect the output to also be 111. All right, great. So <clears throat> knowing well, knowing that after going over that uh, after going over that word problem, let's think about this as a list perspective before we think about it as a linked list. Why is it that recursion would be the best way to fix this problem or to the best way to go about this problem? Couldn't you just um, like call the first index in the list and then splice out the one next to it if it was uh, lower than the first, like the index zero and then just run the, the uh, function again? Okay, I see what you mean. So we check to the right if it is if it is there, um, then we slice it out. But what would happen when we get to three? How would we handle that then? Because if we slice out three, then we would also lose thirteen. Um. Well, since thirteen is bigger than five, then we could have like a separate list that stores our like accepted inputs since it's bigger than five, right? Okay. Yeah, maybe we could create a separate list to handle this. Um, go ahead, Edge. Could you do a a pointer that points to the previous node, and then instead of like trying to splice something out, you would just um, like in the instance where you would want to remove the three, you would then just want to point node 3's previous node is next node to the 8. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that definitely makes sense. <clears throat> so there's one specific part of this problem that I would like to point, I point out to everyone. Uh, in this problem, it says, remove every node we hatches, which has a greater value anywhere to the right side. So if it's to the right side, meaning that my evaluation shouldn't go from left to right, Right, that would be wrong to assume. This isn't the behavior that I want. Rather, I would want my function to go from left, I mean, from right to left. I would want my function to start backwards. So the next question was, if this is just a list, couldn't I just reverse it and then reverse it again? Yeah, essentially I could, right? But let's talk about it in the reference of linked list now, right? I want to mess around with each individual index. Well, from the example that we saw earlier, if I go back to our other page and we take a look at the call stack here, what's happening here? Notice that our original number was three, seven, two, and four, but the operations didn't start until I was at the very end of my list. So I'm actually starting backwards, right? My flow of my operations isn't going from left to right. It's actually happening from right to left. Starting from four, moving all the way back to three throughout this list. Well, if I wanted to do that here, let's take a look at what happens now, all right? Let's say that we have these numbers and we're building our call stack. Build our call stack and we run a comparison as to what's going on. Let's stop right there. Okay, so we build our code, right? Our code happens recursively and it gets all the way down to the number eight. Well, we know that once our code gets down to the number eight, I wanna start returning that code, right? Well, I wanna make sure that the only nodes that are being returned are the ones that don't have a greater value to the right of it. So what comparison statement should happen here?
What should I ask this question? Out of these two nodes, which one should be returned? All right, should this be an equals? Do we want them to be equal? Do we want three to be greater than? Or do you we would, want... You would have eight be greater than three, so you could get rid of three, right? Right, I wanna make sure that three does not have a value that's greater than, um, does have a value to the right of it, and that's the one that I would decide to return. So in this case, out of these two nodes, when this comparison is run, which node comes back? Eight or three? Eight. Eight is, sir. Okay, so eight would come back and three falls out of the picture. All right, so three falls out of the picture. The next node in question will be 13. And same thing as before. Okay, well, 13 can't come, uh, eight and 13. Eight is not greater than 13, right? So because eight is not greater than 13, what number of nodes am I gonna return in this case? Both of them. Yeah, so now I could return both of them. The next number to be compared is two. All right, so out of this statement, what nodes would come back? Eight and 13. Eight, 13. And eight. Yeah, 13 and eight, because they're the only ones that are still true. And then finally, number five would fall. And out of these, which would be our final return statement? 13 and eight. Yeah. So then finally, our final return statement will be just return 13 and 8 as the only nodes where there was not a number higher than it to the right. Does anyone have any questions over this um, specific drawing or this breakdown of why we would want to do this recursively? No questions. Okay, <clears throat> if there are no questions, then finally the, the question that I have is, well, how do we turn this into code, right? How do I make this into actual code inside of my editor? Well, let's think about this. Okay, so here's the actual problem. We just drew it out and we understand what's going on. Well, now that we understand what's going on, I actually wanna write the code for it. I apologize to everyone. I'm trying to get this all set up correctly so that we also still have access to our drawings if we need to. Uh, okay, perfect. So now how could I write this code? I have my node and just like before, it looks like we're chopping off the list one node at a time. So what would be our base case? We did something similar when we did the example of simple search. So what could possibly be my base case in this scenario? What would kill my function? We could maybe use like a, like 
if head dot next equals none, um, meaning like we're at the end of the length list or like maybe use like a loop to like keep it going like while um, while head dot next or something. Okay, so let's do if head dot next is equal to none. All right, so if it is none, I would want to return head. So that gets me all the way to my base case where number eight is being returned. Okay, great. So that takes care of that one. Well, now let's think about it. We took care of this specific spot here. But we haven't gone over how we can make this happen. How do I make my list break down all the way to the number eight? One needs to go there on line 11 that would break down my list all the way down into my base case. Um, I can't remember if this is an operator in Python, but could we like pop the uh, the last part of the list? Or I guess we could just do like a length of list minus one and then go from there. Okay. Yeah, let's take a look at some of the code that we made before, right? So in this code that we made before here, we're passing in the list itself, but it looks like we're just passing in the list on the next index. And we know that when we're talking about linked list, every index is known as a node, all right? with one node knowing about the next one. So how could I replicate that behavior that we just saw? You could just do like head equals head dot next. Okay. So I would want my next of current head to be equal to the recursive call, right? This is where I would call remove nodes. And I apologize, this should be self. And the reason why this would go this way and what I would pass into remove nodes would be head dot next. So what I'm telling my program to do is say, hey, the next value of this five will be whatever is returned from the right-hand side, All right? And then it passes it. This next iteration is what gets passed into the function recursively and so on. 13 through eight gets passed recursively, three and eight gets passed, eight gets passed until it finally gets to the number eight, where it will say, is head.next equal to none? And if it is equal to none, then it will just return the number eight. Does anyone have any questions over why our recursive statement would go there on line 11 and how that's working? Um. I have a quick question. So you're you're basically just taking the pointer of head, which is at the beginning of the linked list, and you're just moving it all the way down until there isn't another head, another um, node to go to, right? Right. Okay. And that way I could rebuild my list <clears throat> without having okay. to. Okay, awesome. So now that I have that information, I know how to I know how to handle it at my edge case. I know how to handle it in recursive state. But now, what about the logic that we just wrote down? We made this logic where we're running a comparison statement between the left and right nodes, and then deciding which one of the nodes we would be returning. So how do I write that comparison statement? when I'm talking in reference to codes, I mean, to nodes, what would go here on line 12? To do like, if head is less than head.next, you return head, and then if not, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. So could you say that one more time? If what? Like if head is less than. Okay, so uh, 
Oh, is less than. Head that next. And we would want the value of that head dot next, right? Yes. Awesome. And then would you return that whole node or just? Well, which one of these two nodes would be returned, right? So in this example here, when we compared three, three would be head and eight would be head dot next. And it looks mm -hmm. like the one that was returned was eight. So what would get returned in this statement? Would it be head or head dot next? So it'd be head dot next. Okay, great. So let's say that this statement isn't triggered. Uh, none of these are happening, right? Because if we take a look at eight, well, head dot next is equal to none. So that would return head. Uh, that would remove them. Well, what if my list only had one value inside of it? That would still just return head. Well, let's check what this does. Maybe that last statement isn't necessary. Let's see what's going on here. So as I run this, I run into a none type error. So head.val and head.next. So none type object has no attribute val. All right. So it seems like this is iterating through all the way until head.next is equal to none. And then it checks if the value is less than the value of head. But we know we can't do that. So let's say if head.next and head.val is less than head.next, just to make sure that it doesn't do that against a none statement. Okay, so we see that our first one was wrong because it returns an empty list. And we can see that our second one is also wrong because they both return an empty list. Interesting. So it seems like this function knows how to call itself recursively, but it doesn't know how to return an actual statement at the very end yet, does it? It only knows how to return in a recursive state because these two values here address the recursion. Well, how do I end the function? How does my function know when it's done? What could I return here? When it makes its way to the bottom of the call stack, you want to return head so that it's the bottom of the call stack pointing to everything else we just iterated through. Perfect. So now I would finally just return head because once I rebuild my entire list, I am now ready to just return head. And now we can see that we are returning 13 and eight and we are returning one, one, one. And that's how we solve this problem with recursion. So anything that has to start from the right-hand side it's usually better solved through recursion because it creates this stack method. It has us where we can destroy whatever data structure that we're currently working with and start from the right-hand side and reevaluate going back towards the left. Does anyone have any questions over this problem? Go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, um, when me and Jose were working on that yesterday, we we like couldn't figure out what exactly was being passed like by leak code, like the, where it says head equals that list. What, what exactly is the head referring to then when you access it? Yeah. So head is just one node, one specific node. Um, head is in reference to five. Okay. And then dot next is in reference to two. Okay. Does that answer your question, Tyler? Yeah. So, okay. I, I guess that's that's what we were confused about because, like, it it shows like in the examples on the left, like head equals that whole list, and you're like, what what does that actually what does that actually mean? We were having troubles accessing the value, but I think I I realized that just because we weren't returning 
the head because we kept getting the same non type error. Um, but so the in essence, if you were to if you were to flip the recursive, if you if you put the recursive state after the if statement, would that that would just fail? Right, yeah. because then you go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just I was just asking if that would fail because you you don't have a next. Right, exactly. It would fail because my set dot next hasn't been set yet. Right. So in line fifteen, I'm running logic evaluating next, but next doesn't exist until this remove nodes function that's happening recursively finally returns that last node within my linked list. Gotcha. Okay. So that's right. Cause that, that recursive call is executing before an if statement ever happens, right? Where the if statement's evaluated. Right. So none of this code is, uh, is executed. And so the very first call goes through these, right? But then nothing else gets executed until we get down to the very last node. And once we get down to the very last node, then everything else after that starts picking up and returning back to the call stack. Does okay. that make sense, Tyler? It does, yeah. Thank you. Of course. All right. Uh, I think next was David. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. This is probably covered. I'm just not understanding line 17, like why return head and like what that looks like. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we're working with this in a recursive state, right? Where remove notes is being called through through recursion over and over again. Well, this head is still in reference to the original head, even though our pointer uh started. And we basically told our pointer to no longer look at the head of at the original head when we did this recursion state here. Even though we did that, our function is still tracking on a head. And this function has to return the head of the linked list in order for the linked list to be accessible to anyone. So that's why we need to return the head itself at the end of the function. Otherwise, if we run it, it's not going to return anything at all. And we'll just get empty list because it has no idea what to do. Finally, so, when I return then, that's what gives it access to the linked list. Go ahead. I understand how eight is populating in there in head, right? That's lines 10 and 11. I don't understand how 13 gets rolled up into head. Got it. So how does 13 get rolled up into head? Okay. So... These lines, hmm, how do I explain this again? So uh, let me see. The best way that I can say this is this remove nodes on the right-hand side, even though we're only calling it once in this function as we're imaging it, we're actually calling this entire function over and over again. So if I take a look down here, uh, da -da -da. Oh. This function, rather than being called once, it's being called here. It's being called again here. And here. So this function isn't only being called once throughout the entire duration. It's being called over and over again and through each call stack. Now, what's happening is this line eight only triggers this full, uh, this if not head, right? So if not, uh, I apologize. This code is a little bit different than what we have. So if hot, if not next, uh, Next, return 
head. Okay. So once it identifies that dot next does not have another head, another dot, uh, that the head does not have another next, it returns the number eight as our node. But that number eight is just equal to head dot next, right? Now that head dot next, currently the head would be three. So head is looking at three and we're saying, okay, well, out of these two, if head dot next exists, my current value is three, is three greater than eight. It's not, so I'm gonna return eight. So now eight falls back into this line. Oh, hello. Oh no, it doesn't let me change the font. All right, so now eight falls back into this line and occupies head dot next. But in that next call, head is 13. So now it evaluates it, sees that it's not true, right? So uh, 13 <clears throat> is greater than eight. So what gets returned is 13. And by returning 13, we also have access to eight because it's a linked list. So then 13 falls into self dot into head dot next. 13 gets evaluated against the node of two. And it says, is two greater than 13? Well, it's not. So it returns 13 one more time. And then it evaluates five and 13 because 13 falls under head dot next. Five and three, five is not greater than 13. So again, it returns 13 as my final list node. So all I have is a link between 13 and eight. Did that answer your question, Tyler? I think that was Tyler. Yeah, it was me, but uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, awesome. All right, Landon. Yeah, I put the question in the whiskey questions. It was why um, on line 15, if you wrote it as if head.val and head.next, uh, it was airing out on the head.val portion if you just flip flop them. Let's see, whiskey questions. Sorry, I lost my channel. Here you are. All right, whisking questions. So you're asking why in line 15, why does it freak out if I switch them around? Yes. Yeah. Um. So currently right now, and I'm asking if head.next exists. So if head.next does not exist, meaning that this right here returned none, Um. I would want to make sure that as soon as I see that it returns none, I just return the head. I don't want to run any more evaluation into it, right? So if I switch these two around, when it goes into head.next, next would be none. And if I try to access an attribute named val, none doesn't have an attribute that's named val. So if I try to switch these around, the if statement on my right-hand side will get executed first. I mean, on my left-hand side. So because the if statement on my left-hand side gets executed first, why did that work? That was supposed to freak out. Let me try that over time. Uh, I guess pressing the same button twice isn't gonna change anything. I wonder if that's working. I'm pretty sure that's working because of this up here. It was, uh, it was on the left side of your operator on line 15 that instead of writing uh, head.next and head.value, if you just flip those in position, it it causes it to error. Like if you return to your correct code that you had before and okay. just switch the left side of the operator to say head.value and head.next, it airs out. So where where you have the Whoa. syntax highlighted, if you just rename that the head.next. Um so or Oh, yeah. if I rename this to head.next? Yep, and the other one to head.value. Yep. Oh, okay, because I'm running, that would be running a different comparison, right? So this right here in itself is a comparison. And it, this is asking if head.next is not equal to none. So that's what that's asking. And the right-hand side is asking if the head's current value is less than head.next.val. I'm just using shorthand to check if that value is none or not. 
Okay. All right. I thought, yeah, I think I got it wrong. I thought the left side was evaluating first and then checking whether or not the head.next value was less than those combined. Okay. All right. Awesome. And then I think I see another question in the chat. This one's from head.next.value is the value of that node. Uh, oh, that was me just sort of giving commentary on the node. Oh, okay. Awesome. All right. And then Landon, okay, Athena. Is line 10 doing like sort of two different things? Like it's checking for that last test case if you're removing these sort of stop um, the, the value, the recursive call because you've already removed everything. But also if uh, you were explaining it um, when it returns that it is not greater than so like in your your test case where three is not greater than eight it's it's checking that none value or am i misunderstanding yeah so that comparison right here on line 15 is running every single time where it's checking that it's not a none value and that's to compensate for eight where eight could possibly have a none value to the right hand side of it but once it goes into three it's going to run that comparison, make sure that the next is not none, which it won't be. It will be eight, and then continue on with the logic. That's what's happening there. That's right. And then it's going to just return head? It will either return head or it will return dot next. It's going to return either eight or three, three being head and dot next being eight, depending if eight is greater than three, which in that case it is. So it returns dot next. Right. But in the case of 13, where 13 is not is is greater than eight and eight is not greater than 13, it returned head, which is 13. All right. I saw some head nods. All right. I see a couple of other questions. I apologize, everyone. It is it is 1132. Um, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. I hope this was helpful and I hope everybody has a solid a solid understanding of recursion. There's a couple of problems for this weekend for you all to practice recursion. And the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. Um, at this point, this is going to conclude our lecture. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.